Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Edith Yang. I am one of the co-founders of Founders Hong Kong and also the founders of Race Capital. So today I'm like super excited to have Tony Wong, who is the co-founder of Shopline, uh, joining us. And we're going to have a long, casual conversation about his founding journey and stories. But before I start, um, a quick sort of updates and public announcement for Founders Hong Kong. For those of you whose first time or maybe is a you know, second time or third time joining our event, we um, do this every month, um, usually in sort of interviewing a founders who have originally from Hong Kong or, or folks, Hong Kong founders, but in Silicon Valley. Our mission is really about connecting Silicon Valley to Hong Kong and really wanted to cultivate you know, the startup community on both sides and connecting the dot. Um, so next year, just a quick preview, we're working on a few projects, including um, start of the year in January, we're going to have Alfred Chong, founder and CEO of Race Capital and also BEA System to be sort of our kickoff of a prediction of 2023. And then we're also working on the Hong Kong Internet Report once again. We published it last year. We're also working on that um, hopefully 20 later on, maybe after Chinese New Year. So we're going to send out a survey, also get some of your input. and then. Um, so yeah, see, let's check out for the uh, survey coming soon. Uh, so with that said, let's go back and you know get this whole conversation started. I, Tony, I realized we met each other, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, I want to say like at least eight, nine years ago. Yeah, I believe it was 2014 or something like close to that. So yeah, about eight years ago. That's a long time. And I remember when you guys... Um, you and Fiana first started a shop line, but maybe we can start a conversation with tell us about sort of your story. How did you guys come up with the idea? How did you find each other and all that good stuff? Yeah, for sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tony, uh, co-founder of Shopline. Um, Shopline, for everybody, just to give you a quick background, it's an e-commerce platform for merchants in Asia, helping them with uh, launching their online store, managing it from their online solution to the offline solution, giving you a POS, um, a POS, a POS machine for your retails and also your CRM. So all in one solution to manage your online strategy for merchants. Uh, we focus on Asia, we started in 2013 and we grew up I mean, uh, like quite crazy in Asia. We have over uh, 1500 people across the entire Asia in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia and whatnot. Um, so our founding story is quite uh, interesting. So people keep saying, oh, how did I come up with the idea or how do we start it? But it all starts with like finding your co-founder and meeting them first. Um, at the beginning, uh, I met Fiona in a, uh, in, a, in, in a startup event. So we went to this event called Startup Weekend in which a bunch of founders uh, go in there with technical background design or business background. And then like somebody pitched an idea and then you get together and try to um, try to form the business and pitch it at the end of the weekend. Um, mm. Funnily, uh, Shopline idea was not pitching there. I did not work with Fiona in the same team, but we just met, just happened to randomly met. But because it forms a community in that event that you keep in touch with each other after the event. And afterwards, uh, when we had an idea to like, wanted to do something, then we reconnected and say, hey, let's do this. And how the shop line came about was that um, we we actually pivoted quite a bit, like like most startup. Like you, it's not like I woke up and I wanted to do shop line as it is. So mm -hmm. what we wanted to solve uh, the problem is I wanted to do e-commerce. That was like the most straight thing, like the thing that we set in stone e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Because in Hong Kong specifically, ten years ago, e-commerce was not a thing. Um, the only prominent player back then was um, Yahoo Auction, uh, where you have to like bid it. And what I saw uh, a gap in the system in which like people are not allowed to leave their contacts in between, so you cannot talk to each other. You can only talk on the platform, right. but you try to go to the MTR to exchange goods. So that was a system in Hong Kong. So mm -hmm. we wanted to solve that, and we started to build like a marketplace uh, thing that you can uh, post things and buy things. We posted it. I mean, we built it in like six weeks. Uh, we had an app in the app store. Actually, a thousand people were transacting in the platform within like a couple of weeks. Wow. So it was a really good idea. Nothing invalidated. It was valid. But then came about the issue about how to monetize, how to survive. Uh, mm -hmm. Like Because 
that this is my second startup. So I did one before that crash. Uh, so my sense of um, trying to stay alive was still <laughs> in there. Like I wanted to survive. So we, I, we quickly changed the model by interviewing a lot of like our users. So we found out that a lot of users needed their online store. Most of them didn't even know how to buy a domain name and right. they didn't know how to stock. They just want to sell and have their online store. And with my previous background as a developer, in which a lot of uh, friends were coming to me, hey, I want to set up an online store. And then I said, hey, why don't you just use Shopify? Uh, it's already there. It's self-serve. Don't bother me because I don't want to build something one off. And then right. I said, what? Like, like uh, I, I, I've never heard of it. I don't know how to use it. Everything's in English. Uh, they don't they don't have support in the region. So let's say, and with that in the back of my mind, I said like, hey, they need online store. Let's build a self serve and serve the local community here. So that's how we came about the idea, and we pivoted very quickly. So so wait, just for me to clarify, there was a startup weekend in Hong Kong. Yes, yes, there are a few, really? uh, but oh. bro, right now I, I don't think there they have that many right now. But yeah. Hmm. Uh, maybe we should like start a start a weekend in Hong Kong again. Um, uh, yeah. and yeah, uh, with that said, so all all these users that you say was like try it out, they were all in Hong Kong. So they 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 just never heard of Shopify, which is a huge thing in America. But I guess just because even till today they don't have support in Asia, right? Uh, not it's very limited. The way to do it is like not very friendly way or not, not reachable way. So it takes a long time. And for Asian um, mentality, that they're very impatient in Asia. Like they need the the, the answer very quick. Uh, hmm. Which a lot of like um, actually a lot of companies in the West they don't they cannot do that instant uh, reply to them. Right. Um, Tony, one thing like before we go on, I, I want to ask you a whole bunch of questions related to fundraising, but maybe just quickly, your background is you worked at TVB like as an engineer, right? Like, how, yeah. So you actually like worked in a, a company before and then, sure. yeah. So so it's kind of funny. My background is quite interesting. So I, I moved around the world quite a bit. Um, I was born and raised in South America, immigrated to Canada, dad from Hong Kong, mom from Malaysia lived in Singapore and Bay Area for a bit. Uh, but my graduate started as actually electrical engineering. So mm -hmm. I didn't learn any coding at school, but, was, but still engineering background. But as I did a lot of internships, I did an internship in Singapore and Hong Kong as well um, before actually graduating. And then I, when I graduated, I felt that, okay, I want to do engineering, like I want a software, like I want to write software because mm -hmm. um, I'm also someone who is very impatient. I want to see the results very quickly. So I felt software will allow me to like build something really quick and have some iterations. Um, so I changed my career back then and uh, I was able to find an uh, uh, engineering position in TVB in which mm -hmm. I built like the one of the first versions of like the Netflix for TVB in which like you can uh, go online the platform and actually watch some episodes of mm -hmm. the network. <laughs> okay. And, and, and then I guess... You don't want to work in a big company anymore, so you wanted to quit and start your new thing. Yeah, so I felt that uh, there was a lot of constraints with working in a company back then, especially when it's very traditional Hong Kong uh, mentality in which like everything is top down, and then there was a lot of constraints to launching new products or innovating. Um, and I actually tried many different things internally, but a lot of things didn't work out. Um, so that's the reason why I kind of like spin out, hey, I want to do my own thing. And and yeah, quit the like nine to five job um to to build something on my own. Good, good for you. Um, so I guess as you mentioned, you talk to customers and you yeah. realize a whole bunch of people are like, what the hell is sorry, what the heck is Shopify? And you want to build an Asia version of it. So now, okay, you're gonna start. How did you come up with the money like to pay for all these things? Did you actually like raise seed in Hong Kong and then later on go overseas? How how did that whole fundraising you know when came up? Yeah, that, that's very interesting. So uh, when we started, like we, we didn't have money, like we just like living off savings, and then uh, we put together some money, not a lot, I believe, like a few thousand US dollars, like ten thousand less than that. Just to pay for some server costs um, and whatnot, uh, but there, there's one thing that is very important, and I think like for founders uh, where you're starting, um, it's very important to have um, expectation management with each other. 
on how long is this going to run and for how long, like without cash. Um, and we had like a um, thing that we said, uh, we're going to go one year to one year and a half without salary. Like, are we okay with this? And if that doesn't work, then yeah, we, we just separate our own ways and find a job. Okay. Um, so it was a good expectation management in between. And so how uh, at the beginning, we, we kept building our app, trying to get users, try to bootstrap it. Um, the money we used it, that we pulled together was for the servers and play some ads. Back then, ads on Facebook were very cheap, like $50 HKD a day or something like that, or even less. Mm. And then we put in some like users for the product market fit stage. Um, and then uh, we, on the process, on the side, we try to go to some pitching competitions uh, around the, the area and try to put our idea out there to try to meet investors. Mm -hmm. um, we did get a lot of like, I would say, crit criticized feedback on um, back in the days, Hong Kong investors did not understand what is SaaS. They keep yeah. thinking we're a one-off agency that, oh, people want to build a store, I do it. And then that's it, there's no product. But we mm -hmm. keep saying it's a SaaS business. So they didn't understand that idea at the beginning. Um, and they, they would think we're a Taobao or a marketplace. Um, so, but that process was good because it allowed us to like understand the investor and try to put our idea out there and try to tweak it along the way to improve our pitch. But I think the trigger point was that, um, because that we felt that we wanted some exposure also to the West. So we're looking for accelerators that time and 500 startups now 500 global. It's uh, one of the ones that is actually more global, like more international, they have more exposure in Asia. And we applied for that one. Um, and uh, back then we were very lucky that they accepted us into their, their cohort. Um, mm -hmm. there. And that's the first check that someone wrote to us. Um, and which triggered how we raised the seed fund afterwards with them. Yeah, I, I remember talking to Ray Ma about you guys. This yeah. is so long ago, so long yeah. ago. Um, like, I guess looking back, I, I think, you know, 500 and, and YC been around for a long time. And obviously it's rare to see teams from Hong Kong like to, to go there, which is kind of awesome. So now you, you know, have the opportunity to just like hang out in Silicon Valley for, for a few months. Do you, was it helpful? Like, because after all, like being in Silicon Valley, you're learning a lot of things that is not really Asian specific. So a lot of growth hacked or, you know, all these marketing, you know, tactic. Does it actually apply to Asian market? And would knowing what you know now, would you do it all over again? Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so back then, as you said, like there wasn't that, that many Asian startups going to this this um these accelerators, like obviously nowadays, fast forward 10 years is way more and more, it's yep. more accessible. But back then it wasn't the case. And then, but I, we took the leap of faith that, okay, we wanted some exposure. It's, um, we felt that that it's the kind of the culture or the thing that we wanted to like take cues on to build mm -hmm. our startup. Um, so when we apply there, like, and the opportunity came that we went there. And there's a lot of pros and cons in like, trying to join this uh of this um the process is like um obviously you get to like go and lift in silicon valley for a period of time three to four months get yeah. to hang out in there uh and try to absorb the culture and the energy uh from from there and a lot of learnings come from that like um um there is stuff that you may not completely translate from silicon valley to asia because it taxes a little bit different, but a lot of things you can take cues on. And it serves as a foundation or, or a foundation for how to build the culture, for example. It, and, and also the, the good thing about 100 was that there was a lot of international startups going to Silicon Valley as well, not only um, from, from, from locally. So there's a lot of exchange in information. There's a lot of camera aid. Um, you get to know each other. And fast forward 10 years after us being in 500, I still keep in touch with a few of the founders that were there. Um, yep. We help each other. So that international network helps a lot. And because there's a lot of um, companies from international as well, like there are a few from Singapore, from Korea, whenever I go there, I have a network. Like I can just um, contact someone, hey, I'm going there. 
who should I meet? Uh, or if there's someone specific that I want to meet, they might be able to pull some strings and like connect us to. So I think that's the good thing about being in, in 500. Uh, and, but I think it's not for everyone. So there's a few downsides. Obviously, um, it's expensive to, I mean, as a startup, money is an issue um, uh, at that early stage. And then you have to like, it's, you get the most when you're early stage. Back then, we were like three to five people. So going in there was easier, but it's still like hefty amount of money. Luckily, we get we got some grants from Cyberport that way, like basically cover up, cover up a, a, a portion of our expenses there, which is really good. Um, so if there wasn't that grant, they would probably wouldn't have gone <laughs> because yeah. that, the money was was a was a thing. And but if the, your team grows like so big, then you have to decide who who should go, who shouldn't go then that becomes an issue um, by going. Um, and also, um, I think like that you need to spend three, like three to four months in Silicon Valley, you mm -hmm. will be away from your market. Yep. If you're in Asia, you will be away from your market for three to four months. How do you validate customers? Are you going to be flying back and forth? So right. that's something that you should consider like if you want to join. But having said that, fast forward 10 years, like the market has changed completely. Mm -hmm. And... Nowadays, is it necessary to join an accelerator or not? I would say it depends also on the person and the stage that they're in. Um, you can learn a lot from going, um, but also right now, it's a lot of things happens remotely, uh, which is the change of COVID and whatnot. And also, even I said 10 years ago, it was expensive to be in SF or Bay yeah. Area. It's still now it's even more expensive. <laughs> yeah. than that. So it doesn't make sense to be three to four months. But I know I see that now the asterisks have been changing a little bit, evolving into like shorter terms, but the, co the course will still be lengthy, but the, the presence in the Bay Area will be shorter terms to yep. be, and be more like um, focus on um, different topics or or like networking, face-to-face -face stuff. Uh, so I think like that's, that's very important. So going back to the question back in the days, like if I will, if I would do it again, um, it, I would say still it depends on the stage. Obviously, on hindsight of knowing everything before, and at that stage of uh, our startup, I would probably do it again because, like, I didn't know anyone, I didn't know the network, I didn't know. Uh, I wanted to get to know Silicon Valley and the culture and learn from the best, very best. Mm. Um, so, if back in 2013, I was 15, I would still do it again. Um, yeah. You mentioned earlier about like your fundraising experience, like back in yeah. 2014, most of sort of the local, a lot of family offices probably didn't understand SaaS, right? But I do feel like Hong Kong have improved quite a bit. Like if you want to find someone now, it's actually much more easier Would that. Would you say so? Yeah. So at the beginning, uh, there was there was a small community growing up in 2013, 14. Uh, with a lot of investors and there were some pitch pitching events, as I said, um, mm -hmm. but obviously the, the feedback that we got um, was, wasn't that great. Um, and, but evolving over the few years forward, um, there, there's a lot of improvement. Um, and there was a few, the, the good thing is that we see a lot of more VCs coming yep. out. Uh, and one of the things that, that constrained us quite a bit was that we were a company from Hong Kong. So, mm. so just because uh, we're from Hong Kong, like there's a tagging uh, as a VC that will say, oh, where's the team, where their base is, is, um, is a constraint and where is their market? So our market yep. started to be Hong Kong. So it was quite small. So back in the days, like we actually, one of the first thing, once we found a little bit of traction, we expanded directly to Taiwan because it was a low hanging fruit for us mm -hmm. uh, to expand our market. But even that, for investors, they would say that's still a small market. So we found that a little bit constraining uh, in terms of our geographical position in terms of the market. Yep. So the good thing, fast forward, uh, more investors are more open-minded to invest on teams from Hong Kong yep. and, or even just doing markets in Hong Kong or smaller markets, which is a good thing. And now investors have more years of experience um, yep. dealing with startups with Hong Kong and investing. So that's a plus in terms of the community. Uh, that we see and more startups have been getting invested um, with, uh, nowadays. The community is more vibrant. The family office have more have built more VC arms instead of like a traditional way of investing. Mm -hmm. They they 
they're, they're trying to position themselves as like a VC type of mentality and the way they invest in startups. Although also they, they may not, even though they still invest in Hong Kong, they might still invest in other regions in Southeast Asia or whatnot. Uh, yeah. But I still agree with it because you need to continue to expand um, in, in the region as a VC as well. But the, I mean, going back to the question, Hong Kong has improved a lot over like the last five, six years. It's, it's amazing on how the community has grown and it's easier to reach to someone um, that in the community than it was before. Yeah, that's great. That's great to hear. And, and then more, more speaking, uh, putting my, my VC hat on, I think even though the YC and the 500 is actually quite open for international startups much more than before, but usually like you you go and present in a demo day, a whole bunch of sort of local investor will, will looking at you. And as, as, a, as an investor, all of the VC fund had their mandate. And, and usually if you are even like a sub billion dollar fund, there like no one will believe you if you are like international that cover all region. So that's why a lot of the US funds is it's not that they don't want to invest, they just have no expertise. They can't help you. So you end up still if you are focusing on uh, Hong Kong, but like for Southeast Asia, or you go back uh, to mainland, they 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 will rather you know, you really should have like a local VC to understand the market and invest in you. So that's a little bit of a drawback. Um, if you're hoping to come to like say a 500 and then after demo day to raise a whole bunch of money, usually it's kind of, it's harder just cause like the local VC don't get the market. Yeah. Um, so um, maybe switch topic a little bit. I, I remember when we first met you, your role was like being CTO, right? So you build up all these stuff. And then later on, I said, grow the company you actually turn transition and taking a more CEO role um how was what was the sort of the key difference and or challenge like when you have to sort of sort of shift to doing something different you need to stop coding and and what else <laughs> yeah so so that was that was kind of like uh, one of our key I would say stages of my career in life I wish I had to make that transition. Uh, my background is more on tech product. I enjoy building products. Um, as a very typical tech person, I'm very uh, introvert. I don't like to talk to people. Uh, <laughs> if it can be done uh, via a script or a chat, like chatbot or anything, like I would rather do that than yep. actually talking to people. Uh, and and back then when I had to like make the change, it was quite life changing. Um, so a few things happened on that transition. So I had to change my text editor, <laughs> uh, code editor uh, tool was my main tool to be the email tool. So mm -hmm. every day I was like on emails, like talking to people and, and, and taking on taking a new role for CEO. Um, I stopped coding at that time uh, mm -hmm. before I was still coding as a CTO, but as CEO, all the roles and responsibilities changes. Um, so, so basically, I couldn't code anymore. I was still looking at product and tag, yep. but not being able to code is kind of like I feel that I felt useless because <laughs> uh -huh. coding, coding empowers me to build something directly and see the impact directly without mm -hmm. any interference. Yep. I can code in the midnight, come up with something in the morning and the entire product change and there's this a new future amazing that people are using but by not doing that and just talking like being a ceo people will say it's a chief email officer um <laughs> it, basically i probably need to but the, the the key difference is like the as being technical you can do something and make an impact directly by being a ceo and you need to talk to people just working with people in general um, the challenges are greater because you need to work with people to make an impact and yep. it's not always black and white. So that's where the challenges come in. And um, day to, my day-to-day -day change to like talking to investors, pitching, going out to events. Um, that was quite, um, I, I, I did a bit of transition over there and tuned myself um, to like, mm -hmm. 
uh, mm. change my day to day lifestyle over there. And obviously learn a lot along the way. So obviously make some mistakes here and there. Um, but yeah, the, the mindset change and like how to do more fundraising. Uh, also the decision making type change a little bit. So yep. when I was a CTO, it's like I was I could be very aggressive, like I could do all these decisions on the product and whatnot. Mm. And it doesn't matter because like <laughs> technically there's someone above me yep. that can like if I do something wrong, someone is gonna like like take care of it. Um, but being the top one, like you're the one, the final one, the final decision making. So if anything happens, it's on it's on you, it's on me, right? So I think like that made me more a little more cautious and and gave me a little bit more pressure uh, in in a sense that I need to be more cautious and I need to be more thinking about uh, strategy or what steps do I make. So that yeah. that was life changing as well. So so in the last eight years, at, at what point did you switch to your role? I have a few things I want to learn. One is at what point you switched to your role, and then also at what point where in terms of Hong Kong, they grow to a certain size, then you decide to go to Taiwan. Like I'd love to sort of learn sort of how you like think about like that decision process. How, how does that look like? Actually, it happened quite uh, parallelly around 2015. Uh, so we started in 2013, June, kind of mm -hmm. like that. And then upon 18 months, we, a lot of things changed concurrently. Uh, yep. That's where my role changed uh, for many different reasons. And then uh, at that time, uh, we actually ex uh, tested the Taiwan market throughout that period as well. It was very, the launching of Hong Kong market and Taiwan market uh, virtually was about the same time because oh. everything can be done remotely. Like we just place ads, but right. we never set up a team in Taiwan. Yep. So in 2015, when we saw a pickup of traction in Taiwan, like the, the product was getting used more, um, the, the merchants here loved our platform more, then we felt, okay, let's, we need to do expansion there uh, with the teams. And, and uh, th there was a lot of thinking in there. One is that um, I needed to hire engineers. It was tough for me to hire, expand my team, engineering team in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, it was cheaper to do it in Taiwan. Um, and so I felt that why not grow a team in Taiwan as well? Uh, and do it remotely. Well, kind of remotely, two hubs, right? And then uh, there's a market in Taiwan for us in, as a business. And mm. that requires a lot of partnerships and integrations locally with payments and logistics. So yep. we felt that, hey, why don't go there? And it's a low hanging fruit, economics makes sense. Um, so we went there in 2015. So everything was concurrently at the same time. Got it. Um, at, at what point, how long did it take you to sort of reach your first 1 million in revenue i forgot but it took like um i would say 2016 15 16 16 okay yeah I think something along it was like i remember in 2013 we did our um we started uh trying to do product market fit as yep. a, uh, now and then 2014 we went to silicon valley uh with the founder startups it was still uh, that was our first paying customer in 2014. Um, mm. and then we still trying to tweak the product, the pricing. Um, it, it was quite funny because we did freemium back in the days before yeah. 500. So free yeah. plan, free plan. And then in 500, we learned um, when we were talking to our advisors in 500, they would say, hey, you should kill, you should, you should experiment, try, kill off the free plan. Like, no, why would you kill the free plan? <laughs> like, that's the uh -huh. source of users. Right. And then we were very afraid of killing the free plan. But after we did, we kill off the free plan. We did the three plans, uh, like small, medium, large kind of thing. Everything grew up from there because like one of the first thing, the free people, uh, free merchants back in the day, they're actually the most demanding, uh, mm -hmm. taking off our law, a lot of our uh, cap work capacity, like taking care of their, their requests and whatnot. And actually, the people who pay, even though it's like so cheap, one dollar, ten dollars, they're actually there's an intent to be serious in business. They actually want to sell something or start a business. Yep. So I think that takes a lot. And we learned that from 500 because, and we were very scared of that. But we learned, and then that was in 2014, and then we started to grow. And I believe it was in end of 2015 that we might have achieved that incredible milestone. That's amazing. And usually, what we see is from 
nothing to the first million as a huge milestone. And then one to three is another and three to 10 is another. And then I guess I remember you actually raised from the Alibaba Entrepreneur Fund later on. So was yeah. it when you get to one million and you start thinking about it? Uh, well, we're always constantly raising uh, back then. Uh, we keep pitching. Um, thing was one, three, three. Uh, I remember our, 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 I forgot the years specifically or, or how it was raised, but we had like one, three, um, six, and then 10 uh, on, on our growth. But when we were, uh, the, the, I think the most interesting thing is that when we saw Alibaba Entrepreneurs Funds coming in, it was like we had sparkles in our eyes. Yeah. Because it was, it was announced like a fund targeted to Hong Kong entrepreneurs or Hong Kong founders only like they have they, they, they have the criteria they have to like have a Hong Kong ID or like <laughs> uh, okay finally right and and luckily we were we were the first batch uh that they invested in um and because back in the days there was like not that many who would invest in like Hong Kong startups so I think like we're very yeah. grateful and, like very um very happy that they did that and that's when we got we invested the money um uh, from them we got the that's money awesome. from them. I, I'm I'm so I'm so glad, I'm so glad. Um, for 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 folks in the audience, um, by the way, everybody should go check out shopline.com. I actually, while you're talking, I went to your website. Now is I I, I think I'm looking at Hong Kong dollar, uh, six hundred six hundred ninety dollars per year for essential, fourteen ninety and twenty five ninety. It can be U.S. dollar, right? Even though I'm sitting here. Um. Anyway. Uh, everybody should check out the the pricing model that Tony just talked about. But that said, I'm I'm uh, we have a few questions from the audience. What I'm going to do is actually invite you guys uh, to come up. So Tony will get to meet you as well, and I am going to promote you guys. Um, so you, your video will show up. So give me one second. I'm going to start with Howard from Fine Recruiter. Although I don't know why I can't find you anymore. Give me one second, okay. I am doing technicals. Hey, how come I already lost him? What the hell? Okay, one second. Okay, maybe Terrence. I'm going to allow us promote Terrence to be a panelist and show your videos. Give Terrence maybe a couple of seconds, or maybe he refused to do it. We'll see. Oh, Terrence doesn't want to be. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Uh, Terrence, I have a quick question: Is what do you, what do you want to do and learn in the coming year? Um, I would say like uh, more being more open minded um, in terms of the topics I want to learn. Um, before I try to focus on, um, more focus on like the the main product, the main team. Uh, on shop line, but I think like it's very important to continue to expand the horizons. Um, there's a lot of new technologies out there from the likes of Web3 or like the market is evolving in terms of like how to work remotely or basically the future of work, um, stuff like that in which like it is evolving, right? COVID has changed the way we work and there's a lot of new um, ways of, to do that. Um, so it's something that I, I would like to learn more about it and how to improve the efficiency of a team as a team grows, the culture changes, the cultural, um, uh, cross-cultural uh, issues that have within different regions is something that is very um, intriguing for me. So it's something that I would like to learn more about. It. Nice. Uh, by the way, for the audience uh, for Christmas holiday, if you have nothing to do, oh my God, I just, I actually, I pay for it. This thing called Mid, Mid Journey. Oh my God, it's basically a subscription base, but using Discord to generate AI generated images is addictive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like playing it literally all night long. So anybody <laughs> want to play with all these like GPT-3, it's just amazing. Uh -huh. um, you can I basically saw people can use um, GPT chat to generate the whole paragraph of stories and then uh -huh. use the story to generate the image using oh, the wow. And then create a whole children book out of it. So um, nice. that's my holiday of the holiday activities um, for amusement. I'll try it out. I'll try. <laughs> it's so fun. Um, 
Hey, um, so I don't know what where Howard is, but he asked a, actually a really good questions around in the early days. You you he really likes like you talk about how um, to have set expectation, plan out financial be, before starting out. So year and a half of no salary is a big commitment. Um, yeah. and and of course it's great like to make it hungrier. Um, actually this is a comment. It's not even a question. So he just he just loved that. But I guess if 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 your co-founder say I don't want to do it, you're just gonna stop or find another co-founder, or was everybody's pretty much on board? Uh, back then, pretty much everyone was on board um, uh, on that. But I think it just sets the right expectation because um, if they yeah, agree, then down the line they will still have they will encounter issues. And I think like uh, there's no right or wrong on that because like everybody has their own responsibilities in terms of financially like like the, you might need to take care of your family you might have kids um uh, you may you may you may need some money financially so i think that's that's important to get it out of the way and even the, the other thing is not not just having not salary even after raising funds hmm. your salary might not go go back to market level in a short period of time like yeah. it's not like you're going to go back to your previous job salary so i think that was part of the expectation that we set as well like and very very important for uh, founders out there right now, and especially from coming from um, high paying jobs, either as an engineer or on the finance or management, salaries are crazy. So mm -hmm. even after you raise a fund, don't expect to get back that salary for many years to come. Yeah, which on that note, like before we start, you, you talk a little bit about Hong Kong have this stigma, I guess, you know, particularly if you're a good engineer, sometimes it may not be so encouraged, I guess. Um, yeah. like well, what's going on there? I actually, you know, like sitting here, I'm in Palo Alto right now, being a tech founder is like the coolest thing on earth. But I guess, do you think Hong Kong still have a little bit of stigma around startup or being engineer? Um, I think like there is still like the community. Uh, first of all, I'm very grateful that the community of Hong Kong has been involved and, and has improved quite a lot over the last 10 years. Um, I do see the thing that most of the people coming out to conferences or like networking, I guess by nature as well, they're probably in non-engineers. They're, 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 they're probably not going to be the people building things. Obviously, there is a lot. I'm just generalizing a little bit. Um, but most of the engineers are sitting on the background and then they're building stuff. Uh, maybe they actually love to do that, that that way because also when I was an engineer, I didn't even like to go out. But <laughs> of that... Usually they're put on a backseat. And when key decisions have to be done, the engineer would not, or the technical people would not participate in yep. those key moments, which is a thing. And by the stigma, what I mean is that if you really compare Hong Kong and, and Silicon Valley, um, you, you, would you would definitely see that just by landing into the Bay Area, first of all, you will see all the ads of startups. Yeah, it's very uh, true. But not, you will see all that. When you're in Hong Kong, all the ads are completely different target, right? Even in the Bay Area, you will see two ads targeted to developers. Yeah. It's yeah. like quite quite op eye-opening, right? So meaning that, the, I mean, like just generalizing in Silicon Valley, they'll treat engineers as gods, right? Like not not to say God, but like, you know what I mean? Like they, yeah. they're, they're they are on a high pedestal. While in Hong Kong, they're still not there yet. And I don't, I don't think it's necessary to go there, but I think like there is need to be some improvement in terms of like how engineer and technical people are treated. But I think like it goes both sides. It's not like the people, um, non engineer people need to like try to level up or whatnot. But I think engineers have to like take a step up as well in terms of putting themselves out there. And I think like, um, uh, the blockchain or the web free people actually are evolving on this area as well, in which yeah. more engineers are actually coming out as well and, and be more on conferences and, and coming out to talk to people. Yeah, uh, I can tell you, we, okay, I don't want to say only, but I would say 99% of our founders for Race Capital are all engineer. Um, and we Amazing. actually don't like, sorry, I shouldn't say that because I, I, I do think sales and business development marketing are also very, very important. But from zero to one, you really need to have some, like your co-founder, the founding team, 
must have one, at least one, if not all engineers. Because other these days, if you know what you're doing, it costs you like 500 bucks like to start something on AWS or Ali Cloud, whatever you use. It's just so cheap. It's not an excuse to even have to raise money for anything. So um, it's so important. We, we should probably do some uh, start a weekend all over again <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to bring as many and encourage you know, engineers from schools to, to start building. Um, it's such an amazing, amazing experience. Um, with that said, to shift topic a little bit, uh, our uh, asked a question is, uh, for 2023, as you're planning for shop line, um, how, how are you going to plan and think about things differently, given the economic environment, uh, operation, cash flow, all the whole nine yards? I guess uh, my comment a little bit on a... On, on the sideline, I actually think it seems like the world is in a weird place. Um, now China has just started to open up and Hong Kong finally no more three days or all the quarantine requirement. This past few years has been tough. Um, I guess for from a personal level, stuck at home and all that, is that actually, sometimes it may actually be good for business, right? Um, I, I, I don't know, I love, I love to learn more. Like, and now if things are, more in person is actually bad for business. I, I, I love to see how you think about it. I mean, like for us, like I think when building a business, um, it, it's nice that we're able to build a very resilient business. Uh, obviously, there will be some impacts in terms of like how the macroeconomics are changing. Um, back in COVID time, our business, like COVID gave us a double edge situation in which like it impacted travel so we couldn't travel around our business was built in different hubs around Southeast Asia traveling was mm. a key component on how to build a culture how to build the team and doing business so that impacted us quite a bit obviously we try to be more resilient and obviously to zoom remote stuff yep. to manage so that we did and the good side of it obviously the business went up because uh, everybody wanted to like um, go online or find a different strategy. So right now the things are opening up in 2023, even though uh, the it, it wasn't like the, the COVID type that people are just jumping into the online wagon. People do know that uh, they need an online strategy. They still need a digital transformation, whether mm -hmm. it's happening online or physically. Um, so we're not just focusing on just purely online. There's also like retail um a retail technologies that we need to provide. So it's kind of like the customer experience is evolving um, mm -hmm. and you still need the digital transformation part of many of the business that is happening. Um, so I think, the, and that's a good thing. And the, the other part is like, the, I think that's the beauty of SaaS, uh, yeah. subscription-based businesses in which we're on. Uh, and and I believe that, that, that because in terms of e-commerce, you still need to be, and online, you still need to like um, have a platform to continue to do business. Like your online portal is not going to completely go away directly uh, because the business is going to get impacted. But the next year, you'll still be using that. Um, so I think like in a general sense, uh, our business it was built very in a very resilient way. Um, and yeah. so we're still, we, we were able to plan ahead. I think like looking at the macroeconomics, a lot of people are just concerned because of the uncertainty of what's going to happen in 2023. Uh, but we're very, still very positive on um, the outlook of uh, next next couple of years. Yeah, yeah. And, and then it's just so like we get my person. So now you are in China, Taiwan, and a few other Southeast Asia countries. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, um, and China as well. Nice, awesome, and it, knowing what you know now, a, a lot of you know, I, a lot of my friends in Hong Kong when they think about, they often think about Southeast Asia. Knowing what you know now, I guess you still will expand to Taiwan first. Like, is there any tips in terms of expansion to for selecting country? It definitely depends on the product or um, the startup you're making. Um, I would say. It's not a general rule of thumb, but how I saw the macroeconomics environment um, from, it's always easier, not not easier. I mean, like the best will be to build your first market 
in one of the top tier ones, right? And mm -hmm. the top tier ones, meaning US is a top one, mm -hmm. um, China is one, mainland China. And in Southeast Asia specifically, it's kind of like very fragmented. So it's yep. very hard to say which one is the top. It could be Singapore, yep. but the other part that, that it would become like a top, top one would be Indonesia. So it's knowing what I know from before, it's always easier to, not, not easier, it will be best to have to be a foundation for your startup to be one of those three uh, big areas, either US, Indonesia, or, or China. Oh, hmm. obviously the other big uh, major markets could be like Korea or Japan. But the thing is like, after you are in one of these regions, you set up your base in there, how are you going to expand to the next one? Is it replicable? Yep. Can you get the learnings from that, uh, start from that region and translate it into somewhere else? Which in Southeast Asia is kind of like, it's not like you go to Southeast Asia and you fix all the six big regions. Like yep. Singapore is not replicable to Indonesia. Um, Singapore is not replicable to Vietnam or Thailand um, yep. because it's very different. So I think that's a very consideration uh, of founders that, but you also need to know like where does your product fit the best yep. uh, in the region. Like in the US, a lot of things are well done, but and everything is banked. Uh, while in Vietnam, 90%, I'm, I forgot the stat, but um, back in like a few years ago, 90% of the people don't have bank accounts. So, so that makes a difference in terms of like how you target your product or market it. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, a little growth hack, because um, I remember when I was working on Dolphin Browser, obviously it's a very, consumer is different from B2B, is basically just translate uh, the app store language into local language, just to see like if there's any uptake, because doing another version in local language is a lot of work and support and all that, but we, so it's sort of like a small hack where it's super cheap to just do the app store translation and see what happened. Um, all right. A, a couple, one, one more question, two more questions. And then I do have a final question Then we're done. Um, how do you see, I guess, shop line in terms of growth for the next three to five years? Gotcha. So I think like there's a lot of growth coming in in, in like in terms of the platform and the business in general, there's a lot of um, um, things that could continue to expand over the years. We're still building a lot of foundation and a lot of like core technologies in 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 the in, in internally, um, and it's very uh, amazing and very um, I would say I'm still very excited for the next three to five years for Shopline uh, that will continue to grow across the region, um, and yeah, very excited about it. Yeah. And Terrence wanted to ask you, what do you want to, what do you want to buy the most? This is kind of hilarious. Okay. <laughs> Any wish list you want to buy, buy a Ferrari? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure if that question was per personally or the company as a founder. Um, so I'll answer both. Um, I guess that uh, for as a company, as a founder, once we got uh, some funding, uh, what we did is that we tried to invest mostly on the team internally. Like, that's how, even though we got that all the revenues and earnings that we got from our merchants, that's a, obviously a source of business funding is another one. But once we get that, we continue to reinvest it in the team and the product because the product, the, the team uh, will generate the product or will like make a better product. Um, and the product is basically what differentiates us and keeps our competitive advantage um, on, on the market uh, because we're a SaaS platform. So, uh, the product needs to continue to evolve. And the more you build on the platform, the more competitive advantage you have. And then the entry barrier for others to come in will continue to grow. Um, so fast forward 10 years, I keep getting the same investor, the same question from investors, right? Like how long would uh, all the competitors need to catch up, right? So yeah. we've been buying 10 years, they need 10 years too, at least, the lease, right? Yeah. Obviously they can try to fast forward um, some of the learnings that we did, but the, the DNA, the culture that you build within the team, the expertise that you have, even if you take one of my guys out to your, to, to your company, that doesn't replicate that easily, right? So the culture within the company is very important. How do you set up um, the, the DNA or how they change your information uh, or how to develop the product is very important. So that cannot be replicated that easily. Um, so everything that we we invest, we do in there from, I guess, expanding the offices um, to to 
make the people happier, I guess. Um, it's something that we'll invest. But we we're not the type of company that will splurge on um, all the equipment within the thing. We would try to make everyone more efficient, um, uh, but we won't splurge um, because we're actually, for us, how we grew the company is very cost efficient. Um, and back in the days, we actually calculated um, every single like space of like like how <laughs> how we design the team. So how we designed the office, it was very important. So every single office that we did is like long tables. So basically no legs in between um, uh, on the sides on the left and right. So it could be easily expandable. So when we designed the office, it would be like, uh, we tried to get oh, 120 CM for someone, but as the team expands, it becomes like 80 CM. <laughs> so we're very conscious in that, that area, yeah. Right, <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Um, last but not least, and then we're going to end this conversation. Thank you guys for taking the time to hang out with us for, for the last hour or so. Um, any final, final advice like for Hong Kong startup community? It's definitely like marching towards the right direction, but any sort of, what, what would you like to see for Hong Kong in 2023? Gotcha. Um, yeah, Hong Kong is amazing. It's growing. Uh, and I see a lot of like, evolution improvement over the last couple of years. Um, what we see is that uh, I believe that uh, Hong Kong is in, um, uh, Hong Kong founders obviously have a dilemma in which like, how can they continue to expand? So they need to choose a path of expansion unless you think your Hong Kong market is enough for you. Uh, some, some startups in their own um, vertical, maybe Hong Kong is enough, right, to grow big, but that's not the case for most founders. So they need to quickly think about expansion, um, yeah. where if they build it, if they started from Hong Kong, then how can they, which markets can be replicated? Or some founders are actually very smart. And then at the very beginning, they don't target the Hong Kong market at, at all. They, they Maybe they, they grew from Hong Kong, they were built from Hong Kong, but they target internationally already. So I think that that's one of the things that they need to think about. Uh, Hong Kong itself, I think, is still a great place to do business from opening bank accounts, opening companies, the infrastructure is great to do that. Um, so I think like founders need to think about how to take leverage of the advantages of Hong Kong um, and geographically position itself, like um, obviously being closer to GBA, um, can they leverage anything from that? Uh, I think it's something that... Uh, um, Hong Kong founders will need to think. And the last piece would be um, as the market evolves, uh, most founders should have or think about their, if they need tech, their, their tech strategy, how they're going to build their tech team, right? Um, some people start from Hong Kong, obviously, uh, but or some people already start internationally. But Hong Kong uh, at this stage is still not enough uh, mm -hmm. in terms of tech. There's still some amazing talent in there, but when you grow a company uh, in which you may need like, I don't know, 30 engineers, 50, 100, then it becomes it, it becomes challenging. Yep. So um, a strategy to build your tech team um, will need to be in place. So be starting to think about that, that where are you gonna expand, right? Because expanding your tech team will involve like, you need to think about where, and be, obviously people say, oh, I just gonna go remote. Yep. I hire anywhere, but even anywhere, you need to think about where. <laughs> yeah, agree. You cannot be. Uh, I hire someone in, um, uh, let's say Spain. Then I hire someone in Texas, and I hire someone in Canada, and all the different different time zones and like all the um, management in terms of like different cultures mm -hmm. will make a difference. Obviously, you can set your own culture and try to stronghold your uh, core values and everything and try to, people to assimilate your culture. But in the end of the day is once your team grows, you're starting to have like concentration of people around the globe. And yep. that culture might affect the way you, you work. And obviously they need to be prepared for geopolitical uh, impact in terms of how the data is managed. Engineers will have to take care of that as well, which is very important. So I guess in general, the tech strategy is something that they need to have something like, like have it, they need to think about it at least. Yeah, totally. I, I think 
as much as I think Remo is flexible, but as, especially if you are doing like pair programming and like and you want to sit next to each other. And then if you don't have that sort of synergy to start remote, you don't have that. It's not the same morale and, and camaraderie. Um, so as that said, uh, Tony, thank you so much for taking the time. It's a fun conversation and I <laughs> always love to sort of hear your st story about you grow. It's just amazing. Um, but you guys have to achieve for the last eight years. Is it eight years? Jeez. Oh, nine, nine years. Nine years and and uh, forward and upward. And I think 2023 will be amazing for Shopline. And let's hang out when I come back to Hong Kong next time. Definitely, definitely. We'll love to hang out. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye, guys. Thank you for tuning Thank you in. Mark, for See you guys in January. See you. Uh, bye. Happy holidays. Bye.